Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the uh, second video in the restoration of this Sony CRF320. My uh, nightmare continues, unfortunately. I enjoyed some success and I am still stuck with uh, some of the shortcomings this thing had, mainly on the shortwave. I've got quite a bit done. I've got the uh, the FM and the, and the medium wave long wave sections sorted out. I've got the gears in place, they're working. And now I'm still, I have been for some time this week, just really knocking my head against the wall with the shortwave section. I found some faults, I've repaired them, and all I get is still a hiss. And I have a request for you regarding a uh, service manual. If any of you have got a good resolution service manual, one where you can actually follow lines, see all the, the schematic detail, please, please let me know. I really would appreciate it because this one is driving me up the wall. There is a lot of information on that service manual. It's very, very complete. Unfortunately, the resolution is really poor. So on this video, I'm going to show you these few successes that I have. You'll see me battling a lot of the uh, shortcomings that I'm still facing. And if you enjoy this sort of thing, stick around, enjoy the video. Well, it seems like my cunning plan is working. I uh, printed quite a few of those and I actually had to make some changes to the SDL file, which was kind of interesting. And the reason is that the hole in there was just a little bit too tight. So I had to redesign it and make it a bit um, wider just to fit very tight, but it does fit. I still needed to sand it with a little file just to get it in there. I then put some grease on there. I've also then adjusted these according to the description, the very, very good description that Buddy gives us in the Radio Shop video, which I've linked below. That one's already done. And this one I'm going to do now because I had forgotten to put this little, this little washer in there. That's why you forget these things. They jump everywhere. Oh, come on. And this is where things get tricky. Now, you have to rotate this gear till you are aligned with the other one on the inside. There's a hole at the top here. You've got to see through it. What I've discovered is I can actually put my finger down here, twist it to the max, and it's in there. And I know it's in there because if I use the tool that I used for this other side, it can go in there. Now, it did go in there. I promise you it did go in there. Yeah, there we go. But I can hold it like this. I found that I can hold it. And I can actually put this in there like that. Now, I put my finger on the underside and it just, just works. And you've got to get that, the teeth in there. Perfect. You've got to get the entire stretch of the spring so that you've got full range of tuning. Otherwise, you find that it won't go from one end of the dial to the other because it sort of extends the, sh the size of the gear. And let me get this in here before I lose it again. And that's done. Now we can check that it's uh, worked, but to do that, I'll just put in, I'll put in this just about anywhere. And you can adjust it later, later as in now. So we go fully clockwise. Okay, that's fully clockwise. And if it's fully clockwise, you take this to the top. If you put this kilohertz scale on there, there's a little dot just to the left of the zero and you align it to that little dot. And then the rest of the alignment is done later. But that's it, that's done. So um, I've now got the FM one done. I've got the AM one done. This does indeed go all the way across to the 10. See that 10 over there? 
and we'll make the final adjustments later. I kept getting this thing not going all the way and then I realized it's because I wasn't pushing the, the teeth or the, um, the extension of those two gears against each other all the way. If you do less, then you've got less run. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out, but now it's uh, working and that one's also going the full extent of the dial. And now I want to show you what else I've done here because I have been busy. Once I get motivated, once I get rolling, I sort of go into my normal mode and my normal mode is clean as much as you can as you go along. And it starts looking a hell of a lot better. You may recall the mess we had here. This was all totally messed up. This was full of uh, glue and tape and all sorts of ugly stuff. Now it's looking a lot better. I've cleaned all this up. I've re-harnessed or re-wired, re-tied the wires. There may have been a case where um, he might have short been shorting the speaker to this, which is why they put tape everywhere. But we'll only know when we uh, get to put the speaker in. And if that is the case, I've got a plan for that as well. Another cutting plan. But this part here was cleaned up. I removed all that, cleaned the inside. The way to clean this was actually done from the underside. So I put it on its side, flipped the bottom down because it hinges, and you can then get to the back of this quite well. Obviously, at that point, I had the power supply out. These sockets were cleaned out with contact cleaner and um, and then with a plug, you know, inserting many, many times just to make sure that uh, it's all cleaned out. That one as well. So this section here has all been cleaned and is sort of complete, but that's not all. Someone had also gone completely crazy with tape and everything else on the side. So that was fixed up. I removed the old tape, cleaned the glue, and then used some of that... Um, what is that? It's like a medicinal tape that you buy. I've managed to find the white one, which I prefer. So this side is completely cleaned up and neatened up. And this other side wasn't as bad, but it's also been done as well. So there's no more old tape visible and a lot of the parts have been cleaned up. And I do this as I go along because it makes it easier when you get to the end. Most of it is cleaned up and you can then start finalizing the project. And just to make sure this uh, extension of the range is pretty good, I've got a signal coming in to a loop out here at 530 kilohertz. And there it is. Let's try at 1600. There it is there. So this uh, dial accuracy is actually pretty good. We'll still refine it later. I just wanted to make sure that I'm getting the full band. And I am. What's the FM like? For the FM, I'm going to use the LV Sub 3. I've got it at 87.5. I'm going to put the RF on. And there it is at 87.5. Near as damn it. Pretty good. Actually, I've got the AGC on, which isn't a good idea. But there it is. Let's try it at the other end, at uh, 108. There we go, 108. That is pretty accurate. That's fantastic. So now that I know that I've got those two sorted out, not completed, but sorted out, I've still got to do an IF alignment and everything else, I've now got to focus on the shortwave. And this is going to be the challenge. But yeah, we get there one little bite at a time. I've also got lots of glue and crud to remove from here. More tape. I know there's some capacitors in there I've got to replace. The capacitors on the main board I've got to replace. Before I tackle this mess and the VFO and check that that's what that's doing, I'm going to do the basics because the stuff that's down here in here will affect all the bands, uh, all the IF is in there and everything else. And... Um, there's no point going to the VFO if the problem may well be in that line and maybe even in the switching. Who knows? Right. Whew, feeling better. When you've got available to you such good reference material as two fantastic videos that I keep mentioning because I think they deserve it, Mr. Carlson's Lab One and the Radio Shop, when you've got available to you that kind of information, there's no point in um, trying to reinvent the wheel. So I decided, before going ahead with what I said I was going to do, I decided to check if I had perhaps the same issue. And um, the issue Mr. Carlson had was 5 volts was getting in there and it wasn't getting out here. So I decided to check that first. 
And what I found was when I probe that point over there, which is supposed to be the 5 volt out, I get practically the same thing that he did, 4.8 volts coming through there, which is fine, perfect. So I don't have that issue. And it would be very unlikely that I did because I think the problem he had was probably a solder connection. The probability of getting exactly the same solder connection failing is fairly low. So I decided to do the next thing that he did, which is to check for that five kilohertz signal over there. It actually says on the board, five kilohertz out. It's not a sine wave or a square wave. It's actually a rather odd signal. And so I probed with the oscilloscope on there. And what I get is that. And if you look at the uh, yellow frequency reading, it says five kilohertz. So that part of it's working fine. No problem at all. And just doing another check that he does, I want to check what I get going to the frequency counter because that'll tell me if that section is working correctly. It's supposed to vary from 2.455 to 3.455 uh, megahertz. So I did exactly the same thing he does. I removed that little connector that goes into the frequency counter block. I just used a resistor like he does to get the, the um, scope probes on there. And what I'm measuring really is I want to measure between a signal between 2.455 and 3.455 megahertz when I turn the dial. And of course, because I've removed the frequency counter connection there, I don't get those last three digits. And if I look at the screen recording, I see 3.29. Now remember, that's probably not that accurate. But what I do notice is that it changes 3.48. If I go the other way, all the other way, I get 2.43. That is the whole range. So that section seems to be working perfectly. So I don't have that issue. All right, that's good news. So what else is new? The problem was that I was still not getting anything on shortwave except that little mild hiss, even at a lower volume. And then I decided to check for voltages and Sometimes you're good and sometimes you just get lucky. And this time I got lucky because this is what I found. This point over here is meant to be five volts and we've got that 4.8 something, which is fine. And then this brown wire over here is supposed to be, was supposed to be 12 volts. It says so on the board over there where it goes in. And when I measured it, I got five volts, which was rather weird. In fact, it was exactly the same voltage as that by, you know, a hundredth of a volt or something. Really strange, really, really strange. And I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. So I checked the schematic. I'm supposed to have about 12 volts over there. It actually says 11. And I'm supposed to have, I believe, 6.3 volts over here. And that wasn't coming through. And so I decided to flip this thing up. And as I flipped it up, I heard a change in the audio volume. I put it on FM, which I know is working, and I flipped it down and the volume cut out. Bring it up, volume goes up again. I thought, okay, there's something loose over here. So I started doing the usual trick of, um, you know, just basically touching everything that would move when you hinge this, you know, move the wires around, flick them around and all that sort of thing. And I got to the point where this cable connection here was the one that was having that effect. And I looked at the plug in there. See that plug down there? I had removed that and put it back, which wasn't a problem. I cleaned the contacts. What I found was one of these wires was loose inside here. So I took that out and plugged it back in. So then I came back here and I measured this and watch that. Not 12 volts. In fact, I think the schematic actually says 11 volts. The schematic is very, very difficult to read. It's a bad scan. The uh, red traces for power are really sort of covering a lot of the text up, but it does say 11 volts and I'm getting 10.29. Now I'm supplying this thing currently from the bench power supply at exactly 12 volts. So that is supposed to be 11, but it's not five, which is great. And this one over here is 6.3. So that seems to be back on track. And um, yeah, what else can I notice here? Well, I did notice something as well. By the way, just to let you know that all things were not well, I put it on, same story, absolutely nothing on shortwave still, but at least this was definitely a problem, which I've now resolved. 
I've got the three voltages that are supposed to come in there and I checked on the schematic, it confirms that. So I've got quite a bit of checking to do, you know, from here forwards. I know the problem is here somewhere in the synthesizer, but that would definitely have had an effect on this. Something else I'm wondering is a lot of these uh, 12 volt circuits have a 100 ohm or 82 ohm resistor that acts like a safety resistor. And I'm wondering whether one or more of them have not opened. Now I've got to check the schematic and find out which ones they are because these things are, as I said, the schematic is very, very bad. It's difficult to check. What is this? What the heck is this? This looks suspiciously like a piece of capacitor. I don't see any electrolytics there. But anyway, we'll take this one step at a time. The point is part of this had an issue. That issue is now gone and I've got to take this one step further. I'm looking at the power supply and this thing is drawing 250 milliamps. The issue is this point over here is giving me 10.3 volts. On the schematic and all the information I've got says it should be 11 volts. So something is pulling this down a bit. And initially I thought it might be the fact that I was using the external supply and um, the mains coming in here is going through a dim bulb limiter and all that sort of thing. But now I'm using the uh, power supply, the external DC input from the bench supply. It's got a perfect 12 volts over there. It's drawing 250 milliamps and I'm still getting that 10.3 volts as opposed to, no, if I just wiggle this, let's see if it makes any difference. No, as opposed to the 11 that I'm expecting. And what could cause that would be possibly leaky resistor, uh, leaky capacitors. And there are quite a few electrolytics on there, especially at the top, there's some power filtering on there that um, could be leaky. I've got a big one over here. I've got some more over there on that end. But um, I think what I'm going to do next before anything else is I'm going to replace all the electrolytics that I've got access to on this board. There's another one over here. Those are usually power rail filtering. And I think most of the section works on 12 volts. So that could be what is bringing down the 12 volt supply. I hope it is because if I do that, I may be able to detect a change on that 12 volt or 11 volt that I'm expecting to get over here. That's what I'm going to do next because <laughs> I've got to sort of take this one step at a time. The, as I mentioned, the schematic is terrible. It's very complete, but pretty badly scanned and in some places completely unreadable, which is a shame. I've looked at all my normal sources of where to get these schematics and the best one I've got is still not very good. So, the saga continues. Well, I've replaced those capacitors that I said I was going to replace and they look pretty grotty. And I want to look at the result and I see that I've still got my 10.4. I think it was 10.3 before. So that was not an issue. That was not dropping the, um, the voltage down. So I'm a little bit stumped at the moment and the problem I'm having, well, let me tell you what else I've found. I've actually found various signals on here. There is a 45 or 42 megahertz. There's a range that you're supposed to see here, 42 point something to 44 or 46 point something. I've got that there. I've got signals coming out of there. The problem I've got is I don't have a good enough schematic to be able to really fault find in detail. It's... Um, very, very basic, the kind of uh, information that I can get from the schematic itself. And that isn't helping at all because, yeah, I, I need to follow, I need to get more information. I need to be able to see where component leads go on the circuit boards. And I know that the um, service manual for this thing is incredibly detailed, but unfortunately somebody has, well, the ones that are available that I've found are just far too low res and I just am having a problem with that. So I'm going to ask you a favor. If any of you have a very good resolution, a schematic and service manual for this, I really need the, the drawings, you know, the, the board layouts, the interconnects, the, um, what else would I need? The schematic itself. If you have that, please, please let me know because I really could use some help here. I'll find this. It's just taking a hell of a lot longer than I expected. And so I'm going to do what my family has been bugging me to do, which is to participate in the build up to Christmas. <laughs> and I have to take a break for now. And that's why I'm going to leave you with a request. Please, if you do have a schematic for this or a service manual for this in good detail, I really would appreciate it if you let me know. 
I hope you've enjoyed watching my frustration. And these things you do like this, you, you've got to tamper, you've got to get in here and you've got to do stuff. You can't just look at it and expect this thing to come back to life. Like finding that the hinge was creating a, a fault here only comes from activating the hinge. So sometimes the more you, well, the more you try, the luckier you get. I think that's the same with just about everything else. So that's it for now. And I want to wish all of you happy holidays and a fantastic new year. Make the most of the season if you can. And if you enjoyed the video, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, please do so on Patreon and PayPal. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.